So getting into it, this is a very interesting lecture, and uh, in, uh, it's near and dear to my heart. Uh, and it, in a way, opens up a whole new section of the course, or it's a threshold lecture. Uh, and it's very different from what we're going to be doing Wednesday and, um, and subsequent lectures in that, once again, like we did with the Dutch and the British, we are looking at a very tightly constrained set of systems that are operating globally uh, in a way for the first time. Uh, this, this is the moment of uh, human history where we can actually start to justify uh, the word global because uh, the North American and South American continents uh, suddenly and dramatically become engaged in exchange with uh, Europe and the rest of the world. And Europe flings itself out from its tiny little ports out to cover the globe, and we truly have a situation of lines connecting very specific points all over the planet. Um, now that said, it's important to make note of the fact that global is not real. Global is not real. It is aspirational. We hope, some people hope, uh, or we think that maybe we're going to a place where there really is total global universal connectivity. It has not happened yet. Um, Google is sending its balloons over the rainforest. Um, but it still hasn't happened yet. We remain and are likely to always remain not totally connected, not totally global. And some people think that is not necessarily a bad thing, that when we make these connections, uh, there is uh, uh, creative destruction, to use Schumpeter's term uh, that you may have heard before. And part of that creative destruction is human progress. Part of that uh, creative destruction is deep suffering and harm, uh, irreversible in many cases in the extinction of species and the ex uh, and genocide, uh, which we see in spades in this lecture. Um, and so this is a threshold moment. Uh, 1492 is a moment of truth in human history, and it divides everything before from everything that comes after. And um, so um, let's get right into it. I just wanted to, okay, quick preview where we're going. Okay, so here we are, starting from our home base, and we are going to, where are we going to go to today? We're shooting over the Atlantic. Um, we actually covered a great deal of this topic uh, before spring break. That was Lisbon, Portugal. Uh, the Portuguese were the first to uh, master some of the technologies of ship building and um, they needed to, uh, they felt a need to go exploring uh, and the age of discovery is a historical misnaming. It's really an age of invasion. They went around the, the coast of Africa. They, um, they went uh, across the Indian Ocean, um, Vasco da Gama, and they did not have the vast armies and manpower to totally control these large areas. This is a case where not only, as we've said before, not only was there not a huge land area that would justify these shapes on the map, they couldn't really control even the points along the coastlines. What they had to do uh, with their incredible technological uh, advantages over uh, the local peoples of this vast region is to really behave like pirates. They use their cannons to smash the villages along the coasts of Africa and India and onward into 
um, Southeast Asia, and they made it all the way to Japan, as we'll see. They would smash uh, the, the villages and then extort uh, the, the traders uh, along the way, and they would establish a monopoly. This was, they used their military advantage to establish monopolies all along the coast of Africa uh, using the Presos uh, uh, strategy of requiring every trader to purchase a certificate that would allow them to trade. And of course, they would have to give a significant portion of the benefits of that trade to the Portuguese, um, which made the Portuguese fabulously wealthy. Um, and in order to maintain this network of piracy, uh, or pressos, the trading posts, uh, the Portuguese established strongholds in um, it's, they, uh, along these coasts, and they were also guided by uh, something else. And the first part is pretty obvious because we're familiar with piracy and wealth extraction. But the second one uh, is... Uh, also as or more important, and the relationship between the two is difficult and sometimes troubling. The second thing that I'm referring to is Christianity. Uh, at this moment in history, as we'll see as we move on, uh, Christians throughout Europe felt that we were in the end days, that these were the, this was the, the, the second coming of Christ was imminent. And we could see it clearly by the rise of the Ottoman Empire and the constant threat of raiding uh, ships from the Ottoman Empire, attacking villages throughout Europe, uh, kidnapping Christians, from, good Christians from their villages, and taking them off to serve as slaves in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, it felt like the end days, uh, and it made it all the more imperative for the church to go out and save as many souls as possible. This is after the Reformation. The Jesuits uh, are becoming particularly active. And what we see in this example of Bom Jesus uh, in Go the city of Goa, the town of Goa, India, which was a Portuguese colony all the way into uh, the 20th century, um, officially uh, becoming ostensibly uh, non-Portuguese in 1961, but not really officially. Uh, Portugal didn't officially relinquish its control until uh, 1975. But uh, this becomes a crucial campaign of building churches around the world uh, to save souls and bring the gospel to as many humans on the planet as possible. And this became something the Pope sent out uh, different orders uh, to do, and the Jesuits were the ones who really made the biggest impact. And so here we see uh, the Church of Bom Jesus, Bom meets good in Portuguese, uh, and it refers to the child Jesus. Um, and this church is a quintessential example of uh, Baroque uh, coming out of Europe at the time, the post-Reformation, um, and it gives us the opportunity to look again at how the new uh, situation with uh, the church reflects in the architecture. And uh, so we see a number of uh, innovations uh, in the Baroque that we could be looking at churches in uh, Europe, in Spain, in Portugal, uh, in Brazil, as we saw last time. Uh, or really anywhere in the world. But this happens to be one of the great examples outside of Europe. Um, what we see is, in this form, the elimination of the side aisles that um, we'll see in future uh, lectures, the more, uh, the basilica style that gets more and more elaborate as we move uh, through history. At this point, there is a, there is a pulling back of the elaboration um, to restore an emphasis on the congregation itself. So the people who are in the sanctuary of the church become more the focus and the pomp and glory of, uh, of the priesthood and the hierarchy of the priesthood uh, becomes a less 
uh, dominant. And so it results in a strict simplification of the elements of the, of the, of the structure of the church, um, even as other parts become more elaborate. And so we have the elimination of the side aisles, uh, and instead of side aisles, we have a single unified nave. The nave is the primary uh, chamber of the church. We have the elimination of the narthex, uh, which is the entry foyer uh, at the uh, front, uh, at the entry of the church, as a separate chamber. Now you come through the door and you enter directly. Let me see. Um, and so the attention becomes more focused on the nave uh, and with a singular focus on that high altar at the end. Um, the transepts, which is the crossing of the church uh, to the right and left as you enter, become shortened and stubbier. They don't have their own, they don't uh, manifest as their own uh, church anymore um, as they had in the past with their own altars. Uh, those altars are reduced in size and they become more minor and more secondary. Um, so there's still a central sense at the crossing, but it is reduced in emphasis. Now at the same time, this becomes uh, countered by a more material decorative uh, extravagance. And so the spirituality, the spiritual experience of Christianity uh, becomes the place of emphasis. And so you get this material richness of the colored marbles, polychromy, the use of multiple colors uh, to dematerialize the surface and the form more dramatically becomes one of the strategies. Gold becomes uh, ubiquitous. It, the, you have entire altars covered in gold. Um, let me go back. And so here you see this entire wall uh, covered uh, in gold, and the form of the wall becomes much more broken down, dematerialized. It doesn't. It it still is using the classical vocabulary uh, of its elements, but those elements become almost uh, lost in this proliferation of uh, elaboration, which is characteristic of the Baroque. Um, you see here that the elaboration of the altar pieces are framed in the uh, white, uh, in this case, uh, the white framing of the plaster um, and the barrel vault and the coffers. Uh, that's the strategy at this church, uh, which was often the case. But in some cases, painting would take over. It would fill the barrel vault and become even more uh, elaborated. Uh, Every surface would be elaborated. And you have this drama as if it were a theater set. And you have the sculptural elements that had been flattened into the wall as bas-relief sculpture now emerge from the wall and become freestanding sculpture. And so these elements start to take over. And uh, you see the insignia in the center here with the initials IHS which is a Latin inscription which refers to the holy name of Jesus. And there is a very strong uh, uh, significance and uh, to a reference being anchored back to Jesus uh, as, as part of the Counter-Reformation uh, that we see here. Um, and it's also a, a very clear case of denotation in the building itself where there is a use of actual verbal inscription uh, as a way of embedding meaning into the architecture. Um, and this, these ideas were um, uh, proliferated throughout the world because of the uh, emergence of the printing press and the invention of the architectural treatise that gets produced, in this case, Sebastiano Serlio's uh, treatise on architecture, which is published uh, over decades and released uh, sporadically um, about what is the proper way to construct churches in this new mode, uh, considered to be a specific subset of the larger category of Baroque. This is the Mannerist uh, style of the Baroque. And so you see uh, this 
as the idealized uh, facade of the church uh, being proliferated uh, globally, uh, being uh, embodied in the back in Rome at Il Jesu, the, um, the, the mother church uh, of the Jesuits back in Rome. And you can see the, um, the resonance between these forms as they move out into the larger world through these networks of the Jesuits um, that are part of the Portuguese efforts to, to spread around uh, the Africa, India, Southeast Asia, and then as far as Japan. And we'll talk in the future about uh, some of the role that the Jesuits played in the Japanese isolation uh, and, and connection to the world. Um, and so uh, we look at Goa briefly because of time as this outpost, uh, the site of uh, constant conflict and competition, not so much with local uh, indigenous forces, but with uh, rival Europeans. Um, the Portuguese did an excellent job of, of hanging on to control of this network through its military um, might, its system of fortresses and settlements, especially in Malacca, uh, in Malaysia. Uh, so it was uh, supported by this network of fortresses, these pinpoints where they controlled this larger sea-going network. It also operated in a very localized way in places like Goa. They had control of the town of Goa and a very small uh, amount of area just outside of Goa. They banned local uh, Hindu practices. Uh, and so people who were committed to devoutly pursuing their Hindu religion would ro locate just a few miles out of town and build their Hindu temples there. Inside that boundary, uh, you would see things like this, where uh, the Virgin Mary is depicted as the goddess Devi Aman, uh, that the, um, the, uh, the Feast of the Nativity becomes associated with the, the Hindu uh, harvest festival uh, in the fall. And there we get what we call syncretism. Syncretism is uh, a remarkable phenomenon where you have a religious merging where uh, the, uh, in this case, uh, the pre-Christian Hindu gods and goddesses take on, become associated with the Christian saints uh, and the figures, and they, there becomes a merging of the two religions. And there's a very strong tradition and attitude that these two belief systems are not mutually exclusive that you can uh, pray to uh, the Virgin Mary and be praying to the goddess of the rice harvest at the same time, that they are one and the same. And there is no conflict between these two uh, religious systems. Uh, there's just a different vocabulary that refers to fundamentally this primal spiritual force in operating in the world. And again, this is associated with the idea of syncretism. Um, we, could, we could have looked at it just as easily uh, in the slave cultures of Brazil where the Yoruban African customs, the gods, the pantheon of, of Yoruban gods become associated with the Catholic saints in Brazil to the, to the present. Uh, a very remarkable thing that confuses uh, a lot of us who grow up thinking that there is only one, the meanings associate uh, to objects in a one-to-one -one fashion. And it's interesting to open that up to understand the multiple geometries, the way meaning can map to physical phenomena, uh, and especially in architecture. Uh, back in Lisbon, the vast wealth that is released uh, by this trade, especially in pepper, uh, builds, um, builds Lisbon, rebuilds Lisbon. Uh, very specifically, here's the Pepper Cathedral built with the wealth uh, accumulated through this uh, system of trade. Um, here you see the very active harbor of Lisbon uh, operating uh, as the emporium of Europe at this point. Um, and here we see uh, 
some of the ship designs that made it possible. The points of contact uh, along the African coast, uh, the various journeys that spread uh, this trade network, and how this trade network starts to spread. I'm sorry about the low resolution of the slide, but this really is the best uh, representation, uh, if we could get a higher quality image, sorry about that, uh, of the world system of trade at this point. And it's interesting, we'll talk uh, in future lectures about how the Chinese are moving in their own network establishment for very different reasons and through very different mechanisms throughout the Indian Ocean. At the same time, the Portuguese are coming in the other direction. Um, and these local areas of trade systems that get interconnected through these intertwining of trade networks. Here's another depiction of that same thing, referring to prior uh, trade networks that we'll get into as we move forward in the course uh, with the Silk Road. Yes? No. They are uh, unloading things, transporting them over land short distances, and then reloading them in Cairo or Alexandria. Other questions about this? I think I'm going to have to cut this one short, skip through these maps. Oh, I should mention St. Francis Xavier. He is one of the co-founders of the Jesuit order um, with Ignatius Loyola, and he is the one who is sent out, and he is the one who establishes uh, the church in Goa, and then keeps going all the way to Japan uh, and dies uh, and is brought, his body is brought back and is interred um, in Goa, making Goa a, a pilgrimage site. We'll talk much more about pilgrimage in coming weeks. Uh, but he is an important character in this story. And here we see Macau, <clears throat> which is off the coast of China. Um, the establishment of the Jesuit uh, complex there. Uh, the Portuguese make it to Japan and are referred to as the Southern Barbarians and depicted in, China, in Japanese art uh, in this way. Uh, we have Columbus. Uh, I don't want to... Uh, just in the transition from the Portuguese to the Spanish, Columbus was an Italian sailor who tried to convince the Port Portuguese to look for a route to the Spice Islands. Again, the whole point of this was to get wealthy, not just with pepper, but the even more valuable nutmeg cloves and mace that was available only in the Moluccas, uh, in present-day Indonesia. And uh, Columbus had this, he was a bit insane. He was also thought he was chosen by God to save the souls of uh, native peoples all over the world. And um, it was... Uh, a crazy idea that was well understood. The Portuguese rejected it. The Spanish rejected it for eight years before accepting it. And even when the Spanish did accept it, they accepted it with the understanding that uh, basically they said to Columbus, you realize you have miscalculated the size of the planet significantly. Columbus didn't care. And in the end, Ferdinand Isabella said, okay, you know, if you die like the last journey, um, so be it. But um, he didn't die uh, right away. He uh, discovered the, the Americas, uh, or he encountered the Americas. Uh, and we had this last time. Uh, we have this rising conception of the world, and we have the uh, first mention of the word America here, um, named after the cartographer, Amerigo. Um, and we have uh, a chance now to visit uh, the Americas uh, through the Spanish. And we are going to Mexico. So you know enough about Columbus. He didn't leave much architectural evidence. Um, but first, we're stopping in Spain. That was the Alhambra. Sorry about that. Um, 
The Alhambra in Spain, we will talk about on Wednesday, so I'm not going to say anything about it right now. Let's go to Mexico City, formerly known as Mexico. Uh, and I'm going to use the word Mexico because I want to emphasize the uh, subordinate position of the nation state, as I have been throughout the course, and really talk about how these points are crucial. And this is the, the place of the Mexica, the, uh, the local tribe, we're called the Mexica. We have the Metropolitan Church at the center of Mexico City, and we also have the National Palace. Um, we've had enough of the, uh, you know, at the risk of being too churchy, uh, we're going to, instead of looking at the Metropolitan Cathedral, we're going to look at the National Palace, um, which is this complex, and it is built on top of the Aztec Empire's palace. So there was a palace there before. There was an empire there before. The Aztecs, as we'll see uh, next week, were uh, establishing their own empire in the century prior to Spanish arrival. They were taking over tribe after tribe, and this is where they established their capital. Uh, when uh, Cortes arrived, he came with his conquistadors, his soldiers, and with a handful of men relative to the, um, the Aztec uh, forces, he greeted Montezuma, who uh, himself had recently taken the throne. Why did Montezuma take the throne? Well, Something happened to his father. What happened to his father? A mysterious disease preceded the Spanish and killed his father. There was a struggle for succession, and Montezuma, a relatively weak ruler, uh, greeted the Spanish with open arms. The Spanish captured him, held him hostage, and extracted huge payments of gold and silver. And once he had paid his ransom, uh, they killed him and uh, ruled through the proxy of the next Aztec ruler. And they quickly established their own constructions on top of the Aztec constructions. And that's what this is. This is the, the main plaza of Mexico City, which was the main plaza of the Aztec Empire. The way the Spanish, their strategy for uh, ruling the Aztec Empire, despite the fact that they only had a handful of people relative to the uh, indigenous population, was to rule uh, in part through these physical mechanisms of, uh, of this grid system and this plaza in this show of power, the institutions that made it possible had a lot to do with the fact that the Spanish was not the first imperial force. The Aztec Empire was an oppressive empire, and it uh, depended on the threat of violence to control multiple smaller indigenous groups that they then pulled together and controlled. And the, the way the Spaniards were able to, to succeed in this uh, task was by exploiting this internal division within the Aztec Empire. There is no way that this small group of Europeans could have uh, succeeded, and it was unlikely even with these alliances, without this vast network of alliances of indigenous um, uh, peoples led by uh, uh, the, the uh, military leaders of these indigenous peoples. And so, um, the excavations uh, continue uh, in Mexico City as a greater appreciation of this past. We'll get into this um, more in the future of what that was like. But um, it's more the, the central point of this architecture has more to do with the strategy of in, imperial uh, domination, of how do you take over a, ex, an extremely powerful sophisticated advanced society like the Aztec Empire. And you do it through the strategy of displacement, of displacing the, uh, the infrastructures of empire. Uh, when I studied this course in the, in the history of architecture, I was taught that the grid system was the 
uh, was the legacy of the Romans. And that in the Roman tradition, Europe produced this highly sophisticated uh, formal spatial ordering system of the grid through the Renaissance and uh, into and spread it around the world. Well, it's interesting to note here that um, actually more recent scholarship suggests that um, there was a very well-established grid system prior uh, to anything the Europeans brought over and to a large extent the Spaniards were learning a great deal about how powerfully and effectively a grid system can operate to control large populations. How do you go from the point of control that the Portuguese were struggling with to larger systems of control that can, uh, that can lead to the domination of an entire territory? So how do we go from the points to those large colored shapes? Those large colored shapes are not figments of people's, of map makers' imaginations. They do come to pass, but it's extremely difficult. How has it come to pass um, in the past? It is through systems like the grid. And so um, quickly moving, here's some of the uh, displacements of the Metropolitan Church. Um, we're gonna, the, uh, here we have a diagram uh, of what is called the Enconmienda system. And that will be spelled very clearly when you get your sheets, but Enconmienda. Spanish is written just the way it sounds, so try to spell that out. So the Enconmienda system uh, is the system uh, of, uh, it's a feudal style system that the Spaniards developed in the reconquest of the Iberian Peninsula when they uh, uh, pushed out uh, the Muslims. Uh, and they establish these grids of local control through a hierarchy of uh, lords uh, in this feudal system where uh, a small number of uh, armed conquistadors, uh, Europeans, can control large populations of indigenous slaves. Um, it, it, they weren't called, the, the word slave, in some cases it manifested very much as slave labor, uh, but there was another side to it, and this gets back to uh, the, the church, that uh, the, the lords over these peoples in the encomienda system were responsible as we saw with uh, the slave owners in the United States, they were responsible for the well-being, including the souls, of the indigenous peoples. And so it's important to have a church. It's important to have a church for the Europeans. And then their struggle was to construct things large enough to contain very large populations of indigenous uh, peoples who could be baptized, and they even invented a new system of baptism where by spraying water on the crowd, they were all baptized. Um, and there was a debate whether that counted or not back in Rome, uh, but it was clearly, for our purposes, how do you claim the souls? What is the physical uh, mechanism by which you actually achieve this? And so you have the church, which doesn't hold a whole lot of people, and so you need these very large plazas and open-air situations uh, to convert large masses, and it's also a handy way to, uh, to gain social control as well as through religion. And so here we see the caste system depicted uh, from domestic servants to the field hands uh, in the production and you see the extremely brutal treatment to maintain order. Um, Bartolome de las Casas was uh, probably ethnically Jewish, but uh, in the, uh, the banning of Jews and Muslims in Iberia uh, under the Spanish and Portuguese, they probably converted to Christianity. And he came to the New World as uh, a priest uh, in the service of the colonial cause, 
and was horrified by the treatment of these new Christians and uh, spoke out very strongly against them, publishing this extremely influential piece. So we, we've seen this in Java, we've seen this in other parts of the colonial world, of the, the use of publication to change the social condition. Uh, inside the National Palace, we see um, signs of this Mudahar Moorish uh, influence that developed in the Iberian Peninsula in the presence of, the, of Islam in modern-day Spain and Portugal, and that melding of styles between Islam and Spanish uh, architecture is with us today in the U.S. in the southwestern areas, and you see it in the National, um, the National Palace. Uh, at Independence, I want to uh, point out, uh, using this example, how uh, the National Palace is uh, doing a couple of things to change the story. And so here we see the National Palace. Um, uh, it, it's familiar in its style and form because of the, uh, it looks a lot like uh, Serlio's Baroque. Uh, but here deployed uh, for other purposes. And you see here, uh, at the center of the National Palace, you see a couple of elements. Well, I can't really see it uh, here. Let me see if the next one, that's too dark. Well, you see the balcony and the bell and the seal. And so one seal is the seal of the Aztec Empire, and one seal is the seal of the nation of Mexico. And so there is this effort imprinted in the facade of this building of the National Palace to acknowledge the indigenous peoples of Mexico as being rightfully uh, Mexican in, uh, at Mexican independence in 1823. Uh, the bell is also a very interesting element. Um, during the Mexican Revolution in 1810, uh, the, um, the uh, a radical priest uh, gave a sermon that is called the Cry of Dolores. And uh, he uh, was able to mobilize hundreds of people to the cause rebelling against Spain. Uh, the oppressive taxation system uh, of the Spanish uh, lords uh, were the, the people rose up in arms. If you've seen Zorro, you might get a sense of what the liberties they've taken with that. But uh, it was an upper, a people's uprising against exploitation and excessive extraction. And uh, they could have won, except he didn't have the stomach for the fighting that would have occurred to take Mexico City. And so they retreated and were defeated and executed in trying to escape to the United States. And the revolution was over. Uh, the, arist the aristocracy of Mexico, uh, uh, New Spain at the time, had a very firm control over the whole situation until Spain started trying to reform some of its uh, arrangements and to grant uh, the rights of some of the uh, oppressed peoples. And then the aristocracy rose up in arms, and that's what triggered the Mexican Revolution. And they refer back to the 1810. So uh, 13 years later, the aristocracy fomented a revolution against New Spain. But they still refer back to the people's uprising in 1810 when the radical priest of Dolores rang the bell. And that bell has been relocated here in the National Palace. And every year, through a ritual reenaction of the ringing of the bell, the president of Mexico reads the cry of Dolores from this balcony. And so this becomes, in the Baroque, resonant with the Baroque uh, spirit, this becomes the stage set for a ritual reenactment of this uh, distorted version of the Mexican Revolution, that it was a people's uh, fight for freedom. Another story Another version of the story is told by Diego Rivera, the famous uh, socialist uh, artist who did the murals at the Rockefeller Center uh, in New York City. Uh, he produced these mur murals in three parts, one depicting the greatness of the Aztec Empire, second, 
uh, the process of uh, the conquest by the Spanish and the revolution to create the uh, Mexico. So here we have the Aztecs. Um, and so the, the, the palace is uh, also the stage set for the enactment of this version of history. And I'm not sure if we get it, but it also includes, here's the conquest, and I don't think we're going to get a clear shot of the third one, which is of uh, socialism marching triumphantly uh, across the globe uh, and becoming the dominant system in Mexico. Uh, and so it shows Marx, Lenin, uh, all of these characters that we saw in the Soviet uh episode of our story uh, becomes redeployed in Diego Rivera's uh, murals in order to uh, create a condition in contemporary Mexico. So any questions about the Mexico story? And that's only number two, so we're a little bit behind. So I'm going to pick up the pace. And we are zooming out, spinning around. That is South America. Sorry for the misorientation. And uh, we are going to uh, Peru. Look at the mountains and look at the Amazon. It is unlikely that so many people would occupy such a hostile landscape. Uh, how many people are from Peru? How many people have been to Peru? Okay. It's extremely high altitude. We are going to uh, the town of Cusco. And like many of the places we go in this course, this is not the only time we're going to go to Cusco. Uh, we'll be back. And it's not the only time uh, we're going to Mexico City. We'll be back there, too. Um, and we're going to uh, the Basilica uh, of the Virgin, the Assumption of the Virgin in Cusco. And uh, I'm going to tell this story in a more abbreviated manner because of time. And it, allows us to tell it. Uh, this church was built, as you might expect, at uh, the moment when uh, this, the Spaniards were establishing their control over this territory of modern-day Peru and Bolivia. The Spaniards, uh, if the Portuguese were after uh, the wealth of the trade and Christian souls, the Spaniards were after Christian souls also, but they also wanted gold, and they had heard stories and were convinced by these stories that there was a mountain of gold to be found, El Dorado, and that this mountain of gold was going to be the uh, make everyone wealthy. And so driven by this pursuit of gold and carrying the word of, of God, uh, they descended on Peru and took over from another empire, the Inca Empire, also recently uh, taking control of the area, also destabilized by death and destruction caused by the European diseases that preceded the Europeans themselves. Long before the Europeans showed up, diseases, as uh, Patrick Hoy told us, had wiped out a significant population of uh, the continent and was in the process of taking uh, as many as 90 to 95 percent of the human population prior to 1492. Uh, recent scholarship have, has revised the estimates of the population of the Americas prior to European arrival, somewhere between 70 and 100 million, previously thought to be smaller in population than Europe, uh, somewhere around 30 or 40 million. Turns out that uh, it was a lot more. And the mythology of the nomadic noble savages roaming the wilderness and extracting very lightly uh, from the forests uh, and prairies, uh, hunting buffalo, turns out to be a dis also a distortion. These societies had extremely well-established networks, but we're going to talk about that um, uh, next week. Um, but it's interesting that uh, just like in Mexico, this follows a similar template. Um, Pizarro comes in with 160 soldiers, 62 horses, 12 cannons, and wipes out thousands of soldiers miraculously. 
uh, in, in a very unlikely manner uh, of at the Battle of Cajamarca and builds this, uh, eventually the Spaniards establish um, this church on the foundations of a prior Incan uh, temple uh, on the main plaza that the Incans had built. And here we see the stones of that, of that Incan monument. Uh, during an earthquake uh, in the 20th century, a lot of the Spanish constructions all crumbled and fell away and exposed the stonework of the Incas, which were much stronger. Uh, and so you see here uh, a diagrammatic representation of how a European church would become uh, built on top of the temple. Uh, again, a very clear demonstration of this dis imp imperial displacement. One empire builds on top of the constructions of the previous empire, um, first in a minor way and then more significantly in an attempt to actually cover it up and hide it. And so you see uh, we have various uh, depictions of this, uh, and you can understand how the Inca constructions would survive where the European constructions would come crumbling down. And this miraculous geometry of these 12-sided stones that uh, we still to this day do not understand <coughs> uh, how this was done. Uh, and I'm happy to say that a few of us are coming from, going from MIT to visit these sites in June with uh, archaeologist, engineer, of expert of stone construction to try to figure out how it is they actually did this. Um, because we still don't know. Um, here's a uh, visualization of the gold that uh, they used uh, in these temple constructions. Gold was not a, uh, a medium of exchange. It was uh, useful in rituals. It was not a source of wealth other than spiritual wealth. And so the Spaniards, when they arrived, realized that uh, this was it. And here we see the Battle of Cajamarca, um, Lima, Peru, uh, the grid established. I'm going to quickly move through some of these grids. The laws of the Indies is a codification uh, in the Spanish colonial uh, system of how to establish a town and how to establish a town that is a useful instrument for maintaining uh, order of the local people. And this is, uh, and we'll see this all the way back to the Romans uh, of how these formations were useful in establishing dominion over large territories. And, and we saw it in Chicago with the Jeffersonian grid uh, stretching over the continent, uh, North America, as a, a grid of extraction uh, with all the commodities converging on. Um, Chicago. This is a bit different than that because of the church. And the important commodity uh, was not a mountain of gold. It was a mountain of silver. We we're flying quickly down to stop at uh, Potosi, which uh, is one of the highest elevation towns in the world. Uh, we'll be going there as well in June. And it's not a mountain of gold. It is a mountain of silver. Uh, and uh, the encomienda system was expanded uh, over the decades uh, to be ever more uh, extractive of human labor. Uh, and every man uh, from villages across the territory had to commit to uh, subsistence wages to work one year in the mines of Potosi. There was so much uh, death and destruction uh, in these mines that... Uh, parents would maim their, their young boys to keep them from being taken off uh, to the mines of Potosi. Uh, the mercury uh, was a big part of the death and disease that was caused there. It still is happening. Um, recent scholarship has looked at uh, the residual effects of this system and finding uh, startling things about uh, the residual effects. The system established under the colonial uh, rule has a long tail. 
as a persistence into the present of how these extractive activities um, take place. So here's a top view of this mountain of silver. Uh, and from here, we're going to go north to Cartagena. Uh, I had the privilege of spending a day in Cartagena last uh, December um, because of my curiosity about the place. And uh, I was delighted. I first went to Santa Marta, which is the oldest continuously settled Spanish port on the Caribbean, and found almost nothing in Santa Marta. It had two or three streets of interesting colonial fabric, but the town had been continuously renewed uh, into the 20th century. Um, let me do this again. Um, here we're going to uh, the fortress of San Felipe in Cartagena. This fortress uh, was built in 1657 uh, on top of an earlier fortress that was built uh, starting in 1533 when the Spaniards came looking for a place like the Portuguese, looking for a place from which they can construct a well-protected harbor out of which to uh, operate their process of extraction and bringing uh, materials, a lot of it being silver, from the Potosi mine and elsewhere. There were mines in Mexico as well. But uh, this became the most active port for bringing commodities out of uh, the, colony, the Spanish colonies of South America back to Spain. And so the remarkable uh, situation of Cartagena made it extremely effective uh, for defensive purposes. A similar uh, lecture could be given about Malacca in Malaysia, in modern day Malaysia. Uh, we looked at uh, the situation of Malacca briefly when we looked at Dutch Batavia uh, in Java. Uh, but the, the evidence that the world provides us uh, to talk about Malacca is relatively thin compared to this amazing evidence that Cartagena offers because um, the River Magdalena, which was the Spanish connection into the uh, mountains of, of modern-day Colombia, uh, silted in in the 19th century. And so it became impossible to bring goods up and down the Magdalena River, the main, heart, the main route for goods and people and services uh, of the region. Um, and so Cartagena turned into a ghost town in the 19th century. And when it was rediscovered, uh, it was a treasure trove of this colonial fabric that offers amazing wealth of, of evidence uh, for this moment of Spanish uh, resource extraction. Despite its defensive uh, uh, advantages, it was so attractive that the French, the British, uh, uh, waves upon waves of Europeans came and plundered uh, the treasuries and the storehouses of Cartagena inspiring every time the plunder would happen, they would rebuild this fortress, uh, San Felipe. Uh, and here it is in its largest manifestation in six, uh, 1657. Uh, you can tell by the placement of the gun ports that the thing it's trying to protect is over here. And so it's a really interesting example of an architecture that is very directly informed by the geometries of defense of this geography. And so it's uh, a beautiful example of how Cartagena, chosen because of its geographic advantages, is complemented uh, with a synchronized transformation of the landscape and an architecture that is a very direct reflection of the form of the larger harbor of Cartagena. And the key link, uh, the geometric link, that links the geographic formation to the transformation of this landscape is the technology of uh, 
projectile warfare, which is constantly changing through these centuries. And so the 8-pound cannon uh, gives way to the 16 and the 30-pound 30 pound cannon, and uh, the charges become more and more effective for reaching ever further, but it's happening on both sides. And so the change in technology, uh, the uh, overwhelming forces that are sent to plunder Cartagena uh, in these episodes every few decades results in a constant reconstruction and ever refinement of the architecture uh, to create, to reflect the geometric, uh, the geometry of cannon fire and projectiles. Um, and of course, that's where we owe calculus to the invention of calculus, right? You know more about this than me, uh, to projectile. What was it? Newton? Um, so the parabola uh, becomes the key geometry of this architecture, is what I'm saying. And so from the fortress, we see the walls of the old town. We also see the modern-day skyline. Cartagena is a booming metropolis. But it's really these lines of fire that create uh, the geometry of the fortress and uh, as a direct reflection of the geography of the harbor itself. Uh, and the defensive measures of the fortress is constantly undergoing renewal, revision, a system of tunnels that penetrate. And it's not so much an architecture so much as it's a landscape. They take an existing hill and they extend that hill by uh, reconfiguring it and fortifying it uh, constantly over the centuries. <clears throat> and so we're seeing uh, Sir Francis Drake, a hero in the minds of the British, but in the Spanish history, Drake is a pirate, a hooligan. The English uh, deliberately, uh, because they came late to the game, uh, all they had left over was this measly old colonies in North America, like Virginia and Boston. Uh, and it was pitiful co in comparison with what was available in Central and South America. There was no mountain of silver in uh, Georgia. There was no, they had to figure out how, what to do with these holdings in North America. Whereas in South America, the, the gold was there for the taking. All you had to do was kidnap one of the rulers. Uh, and so uh, the English, not satisfied with what they were capable of achieving in North America, sent pirate raids uh, to raid places like Cartagena uh, repeatedly. And uh, the only way they could succeed is by using overwhelming force. The, the few thousand defenders of Cartagena would hold off tens of thousands of soldiers hundreds of ships uh, because of these advantages. Um, there was a coral reef. Let's see, where do we see that? So we see here the fortress labeled X protecting the old city, the walled city of Cartagena here. So it doesn't look so well defended. So how did this work? Um, let's move to this. The um, the city, the main city of Cartagena, was here. The port was here. Uh, why was this so well protected? These walls don't look so formidable. The reason is because of this coral reef. This coral reef uh, keeps ships from approaching from uh, the, the Caribbean Sea uh, directly. And uh, you would have to approach by a small, a lower draft boat, a very small boat which was extremely vulnerable to cannon fire from the city. So this became an impossible direction of attack. And so the other thing that they did was uh, there was a very large opening here called Boca Grande, which if you speak Spanish means big mouth. Um, so this big mouth was actually closed by uh, the Spaniards, leaving Boca Chica, the small mouth here. And by building a fortress on either side, maybe there's a better way to look at this. By building a fortress on either side of this choke point and on the island, they could defend here. The attacking forces would have to penetrate first this harbor, 
then get to this second choke point here, a third choke point here, and then uh, make it into the city here. And it was being protected from the fortress of San Felipe here, which was then protected by cannons at the monastery on top of the mountain uh, far to the south. And so this is the a geography that is responsible for this remarkable fortress, uh, the system of fortifications that was capable of defending this crucial node in the network of extraction of the Spaniards. So here's the mechanism for closing Boca Grande. We saw almost the identical technology employed in Batavia, uh, something I hadn't seen before uh, doing this research. Uh, and here we see uh, a model depicting uh, the closing of Boca Grande and the, uh, what the, uh, the cannon fire uh, would have to do in relationship to the closing of the Boca Grande. Um, this, I think, is a higher resolution. And it's interesting to see how uh, the mapping of this was all about uh, the geometry of the cannon fire. This is depicting the cannon fire from the fortress at Boca Chica to defend against the approaching ships uh, to Boca Chica. And then you could have these protected landings. And so here's the wall of uh, Cartagena, uh, which allowed for a defensive, a last-ditch defensive measures to allow ships to dock uh, at the port. Uh, the goods were offloaded and through these small protected portals into the city of Cartagena, where there were warehouses into and out of, because this was a point of transshipment like we saw in Singapore and elsewhere. And so uh, from these battlements, uh, you see the mountain up there looking down on San Felipe, protecting San Felipe, San Felipe itself uh, protecting the, um, the harbor, uh, of Cartagena. Uh, and this system of tunnels uh, were also informed by projectile lines of fire uh, where you could defend uh, from someone coming up that tunnel uh, because of the line of sight. And uh, tapered geometries uh, are used throughout based on the uh, geometry of, of sight lines for uh, gunfire. And so you see the tapered geometry of each cannon bay. Uh, this extended piece here is called the Battlement of the Twelve Apostles. There are 12 cannon emplacements. Each cannon was named after one of the apostles. Um, earlier you saw a, a small chapel at the top of this fortress. Um, the fortress itself is built out of a combination of brick, uh, rock, and coral. Um, quite remarkable. And there you see, looking from the walls of Cartagena back up to the fortress of San Felipe. And the waterfront of Cartagena, where this used to all be water, now it's sports fields. But here we see uh, one of the docks where small boats could come in uh, uh, very directly from the Caribbean and access the city in this way. And there's one of those tunnels coming down from above. Um, every doorway into and out of the city would be protected by this geometry of inclusion. And so you, you can see from this spot that it would be difficult for uh, forces to enter and attack this gateway because of the disadvantage of the higher position of the defenders. And so uh, in places like Cartagena and Malacca, uh, the architecture allows, uh, by careful extension of the formal uh, or geometries of the geography to create extreme strategic advantage uh, for the defenders. And so a very small number of people could defend against very large armies. Uh, here's another place, a port of entry. 
uh, to the Plaza Real uh, that exists to the present. The church, uh, a minor side story. It's an interesting story of how this priest decided he wasn't going to be just the priest to the Europeans. He was going to relieve the suffering of the indigenous people. Uh, and he is venerated in this church uh, in Cartagena uh, and in this sculpture. Um, there's been recently a lot of controversy over ownership of this heritage now in the nation of Colombia, but the British have been quite active in saying, because they did control Cartagena for a short period, of saying this is part of the British uh, legacy, and I don't know if you can read it, but they talk about the British heroes who took Cartagena, whereas the Spaniards would say the pirates who attacked and murdered uh, the people of Cartagena. And it also was the setting for an episode in the, uh, the Bolivarian Revolution uh, to liberate uh, Venezuela, uh, Colombia, Bolivia, that was one country at one point, uh, from Spanish rule. And so there's also competition over this heritage to tell the story of the Colombian Bolivarian Revolution. Okay, so questions about this? About any of this? We have a minute or two. Why build on top instead of just knocking it down so it looks much? Um, one of the advantages of building on top uh, is that you occupy the position that uh, those who continuously operate against your rule, you occupy that position with something formidable, and you demonstrate that you have displaced. You displace the other empire by demonstrating through architectural means that you are displacing uh, the former order. You don't want to leave a place for people to even imagine the reconstruction of the temple. The Plaza Romana. Good question. Anything else? Where was it played? It's somewhere in Europe. There was an article. Oh, they went to 13? It's like the, the two trappers. Um, very different lecture on Wednesday. Uh, uh, and a lecture sheet will be coming your way this afternoon. Thank you, everyone.